2006 to 2007 was an insane year for Kingdom Hearts. Kingdom Hearts 2 and Kingdom Hearts 2 Final Mix had just been released, and everybody was floored by what an amazing job Square Enix had done with the sequel to Kingdom Hearts. With a tight battle system, memorable bosses, and a crazy story with new allies and foes added to the mix, Kingdom Hearts 2 caught a lot of people's attention. Kingdom Hearts the series was really coming into its own, surprising a lot of people who thought that Cloud and Donald Duck being in the same video game series would be a disaster. The ending of Kingdom Hearts 2 seemed to wrap up everything so well, and to be honest, Square could have just ended the series right here. But with an added cliffhanger at the end and an insane secret ending to boot, Kingdom Hearts looked like it wasn't ending anytime soon. Lots of fans were ecstatic at the thought of a Kingdom Hearts 3, with Nomura even hinting that Kingdom Hearts 3 could be on the horizon. So, with all the faith and patience in the world, fans waited to see what the future of Kingdom Hearts would hold. What did we get, might you ask? <laughs> After Kingdom Hearts 2, Nomura announced the release of three handheld games, 358 Days Over 2, Birth by Sleep, and Recoded, that would eventually tie into an unnamed Kingdom Hearts game, now known as Dream Drop Distance. With no Kingdom Hearts 3 in sight, lots of fans were unsure about these handheld games. And because a lot of fans didn't own these handheld consoles or didn't really find it worth it to get them, a lot of them stopped playing after Kingdom Hearts 2, hoping that Kingdom Hearts 3 would eventually come around the bend. So what about the fans that did stick with the series to play all these handhelds? How did these games fare? See, they were highly rated KH games and they got good reviews and all, but the games themselves were just confusing. Each new game introduced a completely different battle system, way different than Kingdom Hearts 1 or Kingdom Hearts 2's. And not only that, the story seemed to get more and more confusing with each new game. Lots of new characters and plot points were introduced, and a lot of questions were left unanswered, leaving fans scratching their heads trying to understand everything. Some fans didn't really know what to think of the series, but still waited patiently for the fabled Kingdom Hearts 3 to be released. <clears throat> Eventually. This is such a huge contrast from 10 years ago when the series was nothing short of hype and people couldn't wait for the next big Kingdom Hearts to come out. So what happened to the series? When did all this confusion start taking place? In this video, I'll be answering these questions by taking a look at one of the handheld games released after Kingdom Hearts 2. It's widely considered to be a masterpiece, both in how it advances the Kingdom Hearts story and its new gameplay system, and it's called Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep. I chose this game in particular because it is, for all intents and purposes, the next big Kingdom Hearts game after Kingdom Hearts 2. And I think this video will help answer some questions about the series and the direction that it's headed. Throughout this review, I'll be answering two questions. One, how does Birth by Sleep compare to Kingdom Hearts 1 and Kingdom Hearts 2? And two, how does Birth by Sleep impact the rest of the Kingdom Hearts series? With all of that in mind, let's get started with the story. Alright, so let me ease you guys into this. When it comes to video games, for me, personally, the story usually comes second to actual gameplay. Heck, back in the day, some video games didn't even have a story. You'd play a game about shooting asteroids in space and Pac-Man eating a bunch of orbs. Over the years though, plot has been incorporated more and more into video games, to the point where some modern games shoot for an entirely cinematic experience. And that's great for some people, but honestly I'm just not into that stuff. Now I'm not saying that I hate having story in video games, I, I love a good story. But if I had to define to you what I think good storytelling is, for me, a good story immerses you into a video game universe and gets you to want to play the game more. Basically, the relationship between gameplay and story is one where they complement each other. And this, my friends, is exactly what Kingdom Hearts 1 was able to do. Lots of people went into Kingdom Hearts 1 expecting a total kiddie game, only to be blown away by an overall amazing storytelling experience that was accessible to people of all ages. But I mean, how could they make such a complex RPG story so accessible to even little 10-year-old me? KH1 focused on a story that empowered players to want to play the game, and it did that by giving you purpose as a player. And your purpose is simple. You're the chosen, chosen wielder, wielder of the Keyblade. Key and to save the worlds from the forces of darkness, aka the kick-ass Disney villains, you have to explore these worlds, defeat the darkness, and seal the keyholes, while also looking for your lost friends. And as a player, this is a fun, fulfilling purpose. You're already pumped that you're the chosen wielder of the mythical Keyblade, that alone is super empowering. But then you get to go to each of these cool new worlds and stop the Disney villains by teaming up with other Disney characters and they help you on your quest and find and seal the keyhole. The story and gameplay in Kingdom Hearts 1 worked together, in tandem, to get you as a player immersed and invested in their super cool and expansive universe. The characters are set up well, the Cage universe is interesting and fun to explore, the Disney worlds fit well in this universe, and it was just overall amazing. Kingdom Hearts 2's story does a lot less of this. The purpose that set up everything so well in Kingdom Hearts 1 is kind of non-existent here. 
When you go to Disney World, there really isn't a sense of impending danger, and a lot of it degenerates into this annoying formula of Disney shenanigans. Just fucking killed someone. Disney World's just turned into rehashes of Disney movies instead of being super involved in the overall story of the KH universe, like in Kingdom Hearts 1. And because of this formula, visits to Disney World just kind of felt like, mm, whatever. And the overall story just started to drag. They also decided to really expand the universe, and a lot of new characters were added to the mix. There were new plot points added, and it just kind of got a little too complex and a little confusing at times. Like, wh why, why the fuck does Kyrie have a keyblade? But I can forgive KH too. It stuck with the foundation the KH1 built up, and I personally think that was the most important part. Overall, KH2's story was still enjoyable enough for me. So, what about Birth by Sleep? Does it bring back that deep sense of immersion that KH1 created? Does it at least create an engaging experience that's fun to follow, like in Kingdom Hearts 2? Oh, 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 you thought I was serious! Oh! Oh, no. The answer is no. Let's take a look at the characters, because they're new and fresh and bound to be interesting, right? Right? Ericus and Xehanort are voiced by Mark Hamill and Leonard Nimoy, two huge powerhouses in voice acting, and they both do a pretty amazing job portraying their characters. Haley Joel Osment returns to the series voicing Vanitas, and you could really tell he had a lot of fun voicing a villain with no remorse and just being overall insane. Honestly, most characters do a pretty good job in Birth by Sleep. It's really when we get to our three main characters where things start to go south real fast. Terra is just generally stupid and just a horrible judge of character. He's basically Anakin Skywalker 2.0. He listens to everything Master Xehanort says and ignores how painfully obvious it is that Master Xehanort is evil. You're fine as you are. Darkness cannot be destroyed. It can only be channeled. Yes. Thank you, Master. Oh, yeah, okay. That makes sense. You've been trained your whole life to push darkness away, and the moment this guy says, use the darkness, you're okay with it. That's just... that's just great. You know, if, if you want to believe evil McFinger Wiggles over here, just... Could I just get a montage of this guy wiggling his fingers? Wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. Wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. Wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. Just a little bit of... Terra's like Riku, and I mean, yeah, Riku was an annoying little bitch in Kingdom Hearts 1, but at least he was believable. Terra will learn a heartfelt lesson in one world, go to another world, and just fuck up again and be evil for no reason. But we have to have some form of progression in the story, so whatever. Vin is basically a more annoying version of Sora, and to be honest, that alone is an accomplishment. Congratulations, Birth by Sleep. Here's your trophy. And I think the big reason Vin is so annoying is because he's about as dumb as Terra. Like in this scene, for example. Vin's in his room and a creepy dude in a mask that Vin has never seen before tells him to go after Terra because Terra is leaving and he'll become a changed person. And then he leaves through a dark portal. What should Vin do? Should he tell Master Ericus? Tell Aqua? Ignore it completely? No, of course not! He just leaves the security of his world and chases after Terra because how else could we possibly move the plot along? Aqua is the only one out of the three with a level head, and I kind of feel bad for her trying to pick up after these two dumbasses. However, my biggest problem with Aqua is easily her voice acting. Terra has a huge issue with this too. He just kind of mutters a lot when he tries and sound emotional, and he just kind of sounds like The darkness. Where did it come from? <laughs> but see, with Aqua, it's infinitely worse. Like, here, just listen to a few. Somewhere out there, there's this tree with star-shaped fruit. He's already here! <laughs> Don't, Zach. Uh... Yes, I'm quite certain she's someone we're supposed to protect. Uh... Jack, hurry! Ben, I'm sorry. I might not make it back as soon as I thought, but I promise I'll be there one day to wake you up. But see, these are just the minor gripes that I have about Terra, Aqua, and Vin. But what really gets me though, is how much the story tries to build up that these guys have this legit friendship, and it just falls flat on its face. Terra, Aqua, and Vin are built up to have the same kind of friendship that Sora, Riku, and Kairi have. 
Heck, they even make direct references to Kingdom Hearts 1 in the opening cutscenes. Whoa! Whoa! But see, in the opening cutscenes of Kingdom Hearts 1, you did believe these guys were friends. They were joking around all the time, having competitions, planning to get off the island on this... thing. Not a raft, I don't fucking know. The dialogue and overall feel I got from these guys clearly showed a friendship between them. It just felt natural watching it. But in Birth by Sleep, it's just... not. Just check out how these guys interact. In other words, they're just like you, Ven. What does that mean? You'll find out someday, I'm sure. I wanna know now! You're too young to know now. Oh, sometimes you are such a girl. Hey, what do you mean sometimes? <laughs> <laughs> why, why are they laughing? Like, everything about this friendship, from the awkward dialogue to the delivery, it just feels forced. They just feel like strangers forced together to pretend to be friends. And the problem is, a huge chunk of the game is devoted to this friendship. There are constant flashbacks to these guys hanging out and sparring and more sparring and... Do these guys do anything other than spar? In the final world, even, each character proclaims something about their friendship before going to the final battle. It's supposed to be this big, powerful moment where you really connect with them, but you don't, really. And this is a huge problem because if I can't connect with the main characters that I'm playing as, how do you expect me to care about anything in your stupid dumb story? This leads to my next point. See, in Kingdom Hearts 1, I mentioned how Disney Worlds were really involved and felt important, and I explained one reason for that is because the Disney Worlds were part of your quest and overall purpose as a player. But another reason they worked out so well was because the story that happens in the Disney Worlds is tied to the overall story of the KH universe. Let me try and explain. Anybody remember this scene? This legit is one of my favorite cutscenes in all of Kingdom Hearts. Not only is it dark and sinister, and it shows you all these Disney villains and you have all this nostalgia, but what this establishes is a working force against Sora. The Disney villains know about the universe around them. They know about the Keyholes, and the Keyblade, and Heartless, and all the other worlds. So when you go to Agrabah and you see Jafar, you know that he's after the Keyhole to that world, and if you don't stop him, the same thing that happened to Destiny Islands will happen here. This is really important to establish because no other KH game really does it like that. In KH2, there is no real opposing threat until, like, halfway through the game. You'd go to Land of Dragons and Sean Yu would be evil just because he's evil. I mean, Pete would be there sometimes, but let's be honest, Pete contributes about as much to the plot as the fucking brooms in Disney Town, and they're ten times more badass. So what about Disney Worlds and Birth by Sleep? Well, it's the same thing as KH2, really. You have the unversed and Disney villains, but you don't really feel a serious opposing threat. The only thing that Disney Worlds really do for Birth by Sleep's story is attempt to strengthen Terra, Aqua, and Vin's friendship, which I already explained is super hollow in the first place. Oh man, Vin's feeling depressed about being left behind and has a flashback to the good old days. You're trying too hard to move your body. You need to learn to let your body move you. Right? <laughs> What's that about? I know that feel, Ven. I know. So because there's nothing really substantial going on here, you eventually just stop caring about Disney Worlds altogether. It's like they decided, oh, we can't have Disney Worlds be too important now. We have to make way for our own super amazing, well-thought-out plot with interesting Square Enix characters. Great work, Nomura. Wonderful. And this is honestly what Disney Worlds have been reduced to nowadays. When people say in reviews how All the stuff you love from Kingdom Hearts is here, different Disney worlds, Final Fantasy cameos. That's really all you get. People nowadays don't go to Atlantica to stop Ursula from plunging the world in darkness. No, they want to go to Frozen World so they can fucking hear Goofy sing Let, let it, it go. go. Let it go. Hey kids, remember how in KH1 Sora was a unique and interesting character to play as because the Keyblade chose him as his wielder? Dang. Wouldn't it suck if Birth by Sleep just took all that away from you? Well, too late for that shit! Okay, BB, now you're just making shit up. Birth by Sleep never did any of that. Oh. Oh, I beg to differ. When you're first introduced to the Keyblade, everything points to the Keyblade being sentient and having the ability to choose its wielder. Remember this quote? The Keyblade chooses its master, and it chose you. I mean, yeah, it's cute and all, but it sets up the Keyblade having a mind of its own and being able to deem you worthy of being its master. And I explained earlier how this is empowering as a player that out of everyone, you are the chosen wielder. Just look at how jealous Leon is. And this is further reinforced when the Keyblade is taken away from you by Riku. 
As a kid, I interpreted this as Riku having gained so much command over the darkness that he could force the Keyblade into submission, making the Keyblade heed his power and come to his side. And as a player, I'd buy that. The ultra-sentient Keyblade probably would recognize raw power as a quality that a Keyblade wielder would have, and would choose Riku over Sora. And then Sora, in cheesy shonen fashion, gets the Keyblade to choose him again when he says, I don't need a weapon. My friends are my power. <laughs> It's not about pure strength or power, it's about friendship and trust and connecting with others. And that's what the Keyblade recognized as more powerful than Riku. It's almost like Sora and the Keyblade have developed this relationship over time, and they've come to know and respect each other. So, why does any of this matter? Well, it matters because this is the magic of Kingdom Hearts 1's story. I mean, it sounds dumb, but these silly story elements were reasons that I connected with Sora as a player. The Keyblade, this fabled weapon that makes you feel cool as a player, chooses Sora as its wielder, and at first you don't really understand why, but then you learn that it's because of Sora's kindness and his ability to connect with people. And because of both of these things, this allows me, as a player, to connect with Sora and want to play as him. This is what story in video games has the ability to do. It gives you reasons to care about the game and want to continue playing, and one way of doing that is by connecting with the characters. Which, Birth by Sleep is already fucked up, by the way. Good fucking going, guys. So, throughout most of Kingdom Hearts 1, you're only aware of one Keyblade, the one Sora wields, until you get to the end and realize that there are two. In Kingdom Hearts 2, there were three Keyblades, which is kinda weird, because, you know, I kinda thought that Sora's Keyblade was supposed to be the only one. But this never really bothered me, because you could infer that the three Keyblades came from the three different realms. Sora's the chosen wielder from the Realm of Light, Mickey from the Realm of Darkness, and Riku from the Realm of Twilight. No, not that twi that Twilight. There, there you go. Thank you. And because Riku and Mickey have qualities that are similar to Sora, it didn't really bother me that they had Keyblades too. BB, are you forgetting about Kyrie the Keyblade? Shh, sh sh shut the fuck up. We're not talking about that. And watching the secret movie that would lead to Birth by Sleep, it was pretty obvious that there were more Keyblade wielders in the past. But because there are only three all the way up to KH2, I kind of assumed that some sort of event would happen, leaving each realm one Keyblade, and then those Keyblades would choose their wielders. I mean, it would it would only make sense, right? Right? <sighs> so according to Birth by Sleep, the Keyblade does not choose its master. Nope. People inherit them. You know, like King Louis XV. Because there's so much fucking magic and mystery about inheriting something. How did Mickey get his Keyblade? Well, according to Birth by Sleep, he either inherited it from someone or was just taught to wield one. Yeah, he had a Keyblade before Kingdom Key D. Because that makes fucking sense. How did Riku get his Keyblade? No, it wasn't because he was able to control both light and darkness at the same time and make an amazing leap in character development. No, he inherited it from Terra. How did Sora get his Keyblade? No, it wasn't because the Keyblade noticed his ability to connect with people's hearts. No, it was because Vin's heart was inside his, which is basically the same thing as inheriting Vin's Keyblade. Do you see what I'm getting at here? And I think I really should mention that having the Keyblade choose its master and having the Keyblade pass down to you are two very very different things. With the Keyblade choosing you, you are deemed worthy of being a hero by a mythical unknown being, and that's cool and empowering. But with the Keyblade handed down to you through an initiation process, it's just like- Alright, time to choose the new Keyblade wielder. Let's see who's on the list. Uh, oh, why, why is he crossed off? Oh, cause of the- oh, oh, well, I mean that sucks, but I'm sure the next guy will be fine. Oh, 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 yeah. Um, so, so why is he on the list? Oh, that? Oh, oh, well, I mean, he's, he's all right, he's fine. Yeah, I mean, uh, just, oh, fuck it, whatever. Sora was never deemed worthy of the Keyblade. The Keyblade just happened to him because of some bullshit chain of events from 10 years ago. Literally everything I said before about Sora being recognized as a unique hero that the Keyblade deemed worthy to wield, Everything about Sora growing as a character, and everything about why I felt a personal connection with him is fucking dead. And I can already see the bullshit counter-argument coming, that it doesn't matter if the Keyblade chose Sora or not because his kind-heartedness and friendship is what makes him a hero. But the problem with that argument is he already had those qualities on Destiny Islands, and that didn't make him a hero. But when the Keyblade recognized Sora because of those qualities, that 
was when he became a hero. That's when you, as a player, could defeat Heartless and travel to different worlds. That's when you, as a player, identified with him as the main character and made a strong connection with him. If you take all of that away, that interferes with legitimate reasons players had for enjoying the story and wanting to play the game. I mean, sure, in terms of continuity, there aren't any gaping plot holes in the story with everybody inheriting Keyblades, but that's not what's important here. What's important is giving players reasons to play the video game, and if you remove those reasons, you're confusing what the player should be caring about. And what importance does the Keyblade have anymore? I mean, at this point, the Keyblade reminds me a lot of the legend of the Super Saiyan in Dragon Ball Z. When Super Saiyan was first introduced, it was part of this mythical legend, and only one person would be able to ascend to that form. But then, more and more people got Super Saiyan, and you get all these different forms, and suddenly, the original Super Saiyan legend isn't as important as it was before. It's the same thing with the Keyblade. At first, only one person is able to wield it, but as more and more people get Keyblades, the feeling of uniqueness is lost when fucking Lee, of all people, can have a Keyblade. But baby, what about Erica's calling Terra and Aqua chosen wielders? Wouldn't that mean the Keyblade does have a mind of its own? Yeah, what about that, Square Enix? And if it does, how much of it is inheritance, and how much of it is the Keyblade's choosing? How do Donald and Goofy not know about the Keyblade in Kingdom Hearts 1 when they clearly were around to see Keyblades in Birth by Sleep? Why did Mickey wait to mention meeting Aqua in the Realm of Darkness literally like 10 years later? Why isn't Xemnas able to wield a Keyblade? Roxas can, and he's the nobody of Sora, so Xemnas should be able to by that same logic. Well, baby, if you look at this wonderful explanation by the gamers, Joy, you'll clearly Why see Why are you that. still here? Do you see how dumb this gets, and how quickly it happens? Now you see all these videos like Kingdom Hearts lore explained, and people writing literal essays to explain the story of Kingdom Hearts because people just don't understand it anymore. And not because the story is so wonderfully deep and complex, but because people are genuinely confused by the story. It's one thing to have a complex story with great characters, but this isn't complex. It's convoluted and bullshit. It's almost like fans of the series nowadays are more concerned about fact-checking and proving that there are no plot holes in the story. And if something doesn't make sense, it obviously will be all explained in Kingdom Hearts 3, right? Right? Here's what I believe. If you have to reach, for a Nomura interview or a quote from Ansem's report or Xehanort's report and interpret it in a vague way to explain plot holes in your story, it's too convoluted. It just is. When did it become necessary to start explaining all the intricacies of the universe? And I don't agree that Kingdom Hearts needed to explain its backstory and introduce new plot points just for the sake of adding depth to the universe. There are ways to introduce new characters and expand your universe and still keep intact what made your original story so special. Especially when so many other stories have done that before. Ever heard of a guy named J.R.R. Tolkien? No? Uh, oh, well, he, he's kind of important, you know, author of The Lord of the Rings, you know, it's no big deal. So, okay, so Tolkien did this thing where whenever he introduced new lore or depth to his fantasy stories, he always explained the lore in the form of more stories, legends, and fairy tales. He never fully explained his universe because he believed that leaving things up to the imagination was more powerful than keeping things explained and weighed down in reality. Hmm, I wonder what other story does that- Oh yeah, Kingdom Hearts 1! The Keyblade is explained in a legend, the creation of the worlds is told in the form of a fairy tale, the ruin and destruction that the Keyblade brought, again, is told in a fairy tale. The mysterious nature of darkness, dive to the heart, end of the world? Mystery is one of the most prominent themes in Kingdom Hearts 1, and whether or not this was intentional on Nomura's part, it worked. So why change what was working? What mystery is there in modern Kingdom Hearts storytelling anymore? And the hilarious thing is, Ten years ago, we were totally fine not knowing everything about the Kingdom Hearts universe. And the reason we were okay with that is because KH1 and KH2 gave us stories with the things that mattered. It was never about the origin of the Keyblade or Xehanort's backstory or whatever. What always worked since the very beginning were character interactions and having a mysterious fantasy world to explore. And that's really the bottom line here. Square Enix wanted to expand the story, add new characters, give explanations, new plot points, when in reality, that's not what we wanted. All this explanation and backstory has only ended up hurting what the first two games originally set up. And that's the main problem. Alright, so... What else is there to talk about? Oh. That. So it only gets worse from here on out. <laughs> Let's start with KH1 again. 
KH1's gameplay system was really raw. Attack stuff with your Keyblade, use MP for magic, summons, and limits, and equip abilities as you progress. And that was pretty much it. Just jump and hit. A lot. A whole lot. Uh, so... So there's, like, magic and summons I could be using, right? Yeah? Yeah? Huh. Huh. Okay, then. It takes a lot of time and experimentation to realize that things that aren't purely hit the X button then cure sometimes are actually viable options. Sometimes it's best to have a purely magic-based loadout. The precise use of gravity and stop can also be very effective. However, the average player will probably just go for straight combos the whole time and they'll do just fine. Maybe they experimented with a summon or two and realized they just kind of sucked. And there's nothing really wrong with that. Combos are fast and snappy, and using them is fun. But you could tell that Square was experimenting, mixing real-time and turn-based combat elements together, and they didn't quite have it down yet. See, it's when we hit KH2 where things really start to come together. The amazing thing about KH2's combat system to me is the variety, which sounds hilarious, because fucking button mashing! But trust me, I'm going somewhere with this. See, in KH2, Square realized that most everyone who played KH1 mostly just used combos and nothing else for the whole game. So, in an interesting twist, instead of nerfing combos to force players to use other options, they changed certain elements of the game to enhance your combo ability making the gameplay system fucking awesome! Magic was integrated into the combo system, allowing this really cool fusion of magic and keyblade combat. Summons were changed to make it easier to deal with mobs of enemies and land combos. Drives were introduced, giving you completely new combos, and each drive was suited for different situations, like Master Form is perfect for aerial-based enemies, and Limit Form is suited for single-target enemies. Some limits were combo supports, and other limits were just your typical Limit Break-style limits. But the amazing thing about all of this is, None of these options overpowered the other. They're mostly all balanced and equally accessible. Let me give you an example. Say you're in a hallway with some notoriously annoying enemies. What option should you use? Should you A. Use normal combos and magic, B. Use a drive, C. Use a summon, or D. Use a limit? The answer is actually E. All of the above. See, this is where the beauty of KH2 really shines. You can approach these enemies in any way you want, and not only are all of these options viable, they're all fun to use. And it doesn't end there. The bosses in KH2 are absolutely a thing of beauty. While I will admit there were a lot of bosses that just amounted to find the weak point, hit the X button, hit the triangle button, and win, there were some bosses that incentivized you to sit back and learn how the boss worked and punish their weak points, like Dimmicks, for example. Dimmicks had all these moves that would punish you for just going in without any thought. He could zone you out with bubbles and water pillars, and he just didn't give free combos like the other bosses did. The idea to beating a boss like Dimmicks is to stay safe, bait out his moves, and then punish him when he's vulnerable. Let's try a different example. Let's go with Terra. Uh, BB, his name is Lingering Will. Ah, <sighs> oh my fucking god, I'm gonna fucking kill myself, dude. Alright, so Lingering Will is probably one of the best examples of boss design in a video game I've ever seen. Let's set this up. We've gone through all the worlds, beat all the bosses, beat the game, maxed out your drives, and maybe even visited the Cavern of Remembrance. Then you get to this guy, and you've heard he's super hard from all your friends. You give him a try, and you probably die within the first 15 seconds. You try again, same result. You try again for the next three hours, and maybe all you can do to this guy is a few bars of damage. You're just like, dude, this guy's fucking crazy, and he's got all these different moves, and he's super fast, and it's fucking... How am I supposed to beat this guy? But see, over time, things start to click. You've seen the Ultima Cannon, or dozens of times, and you're starting to figure out how to deal with it. You're starting to get the timing for dodging the bow. Maybe you get some tips from friends about how to set up your combo, and maybe even try out limit form. You see, piece by piece, you're figuring him out, and you're actually getting farther and farther into the fight. Eventually, you get all the way to his final phase, and now you have this new attack that you have to learn how to dodge. Every attempt, you're learning more and more, and you're getting closer and closer until, finally, BAM! You did it! You finally beat him. And isn't that satisfying? Isn't the process of learning the boss, like, learning the ins and outs, and punishing his openings, optimally, way more satisfying than just mash X triangle win? It almost goes back to the old SNES days, or NES days, where you'd come across a stupidly unfair boss, but that feeling of satisfaction when you beat him after dying for hours and hours is just so sweet. 
This is why games like Dark Souls are so popular nowadays. They bring you back to that age of, you know, super difficult NES bosses where if you aren't careful or calculating in how you approach them, you're just gonna die. Now, obviously, I'm not saying that all KH2 bosses are like Dark Souls by any means. You obviously have your fair share of baby bosses, sure. But Terra and the Data Organization 13 take a step into that realm of difficulty. And when you apply the mindset of looking for openings and avoiding taking unnecessary damage to the rest of the game, you really start to appreciate what the developers had in mind when they made this gameplay system. So how different is Birth by Sleep to Kingdom Hearts 1 and Kingdom Hearts 2? Well, way different. Like, holy mother of god, look at all this new shit. So one thing you'll immediately notice is that Birth by Sleep removed needing MP to use magic and limits, and they replaced it with the command deck, where after you use a command, it will recharge until you can use it again, just like KH2's MP bar. Along with that, there's the command gauge that leads to new command styles and finishers. Shot locks are basically your limits, and they grant you invincibility. D-Links allow you to use a different command deck, and they can be leveled up to become even more powerful. Commands themselves can also be leveled up, and they can be fused together and create even more powerful commands with abilities attached. There's three different playable characters, each with a unique playstyle. Like, oh my god, there is so much to try out here. So much variety, maybe even more variety than Kingdom Hearts 2. This is what people have been talking about, this advanced gameplay system and all the reviews. So, how does it hold up? Well, Kingdom Hearts 2 was heavily focused on combos, so let's see what the combos are like in Birth by Sleep. Well, looks like combos kind of... Suck, yeah, they, they suck in this game. They feel loose and slow and just aren't really fun to use. And there aren't any combo modifiers in Birth by Sleep like there were in KH2. The only time your combos change up are when you're in a command style, in which case they do get better, but still. But hey, it's not all bad. Maybe they're just trying something different. Kingdom Hearts has revolved around the combo system for so long that Maybe they just want to give something else a try. Shotlocks and D-Links have costs and fill their respective roles pretty well. D-Links are really neat and actually become your strongest early game tool if you level it up early enough. The commands you have at your disposal early on aren't that great, and they can't really be integrated into your combos as well as you could in Kingdom Hearts 2. But, I mean, it's, it's no big deal. They'll get better over time. There's nothing to worry about. So, I mean, the combat system looks okay for a handheld. It, it seems balanced enough. And that balance lasts. About three fucking seconds. You see these abilities? Attack and magic hastes speed up the recharge time of commands. And you can have up to five of them. See, look how quickly commands reload in comparison. You could have an entire deck full of commands and use all of them, and then the first one would already be reloaded by the time you use them all. What does this mean, ladies and gentlemen? To put it simply, commands do not have a cost. Wait, 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 okay, okay. So, if commands don't have costs, that means I could just use Magnega, Thundaga, Fyraga, Fission Fyraga, Ignite, Mind Square, Thunder Surge, etc. all without a cost? Well then what's the point of everything else?! See, this is Birth by Sleep's biggest shortcoming, and for Birth by Sleep's developer, Osaka Team, this is a running issue in a bunch of their games. Basic balancing is absolutely essential in any video game, especially in an action RPG such as this one. It doesn't even have to be that complicated. Like, look at KH1. Hitting stuff with a keyblade was free, but if you wanted to use something stronger, like magic or a limit, you had to use MP. And KH2, again, really similar system. Hitting stuff with a keyblade was free, but if you wanted to use a drive or a summon, it came out of your drive gauge. And if you wanted to use spells or limits, that would come out of your MP bar. But see, when commands are free, and commands are so strong, then what is the point of everything else that does have a cost in this game? What's the point of D-Links? What's the point of shot locks? Why even use combos, even if you're in a command style? Need to clear out a wave of enemies? Just throw in some magnet commands and thunder commands and you're good to go. Just hit that good old triangle button to your heart's content. Coming up against a boss you're afraid you're gonna die to? No problem! Just load your deck with three or four cures and you'll literally never die. I mean, sure, you could throw in a D-Link here and a, a shot lock there for some variety, but does it really add to the gameplay? Do you feel like you're getting more out of the game if you just don't use the broken stuff in this game? And my answer to that is no. See, the key thing about Cage 2 was not only were all your options balanced, but most importantly, they were fun to use. And they were fun to use because your options were in a gameplay system that made sense. Now, what do I mean by that? All right, 
what I mean is, when you combo an enemy, they get staggered, and if it's a bigger enemy, they get staggered by the finisher, so you can tell that you're doing something to it. When you guard something, you get invincibility from the guard, and you can counter guard to punish the enemy. It's just basic stuff like that, where the system where you interact with enemies and bosses feels fair. See, this is absolutely not the case in Birth by Sleep. Sometimes when you combo enemies, they'll stagger, and sometimes they won't, for no reason. Sometimes when you use counterattack, it'll work, and other times it just won't. Sometimes you'll be in the middle of your combo, and it'll be deflected, for no reason. Sometimes you'll go into a command style and die because of it. The point I'm making here is, because the system is so wonky, and fighting normal enemies is so frustrating in Birth by Sleep, why would you even want to deal with them? Just use all your overpowered commands and you won't have to deal with them. This makes the command deck not only the most viable option, it's pretty much the only option you have to deal with unversed and bosses and- Holy shit, we haven't even talked about bosses yet. <sighs> so, as I mentioned before with KH2, bosses were designed in a way that rewarded you when you decided to take a step back and figure out the boss's patterns and avoid taking unnecessary damage. Even KH1 realized this with bosses like Sephiroth. Bosses in Birth by Sleep, though, are just a product of the shitty system that they're in. Man, what the fuck? So anything that's not a command or shot lock just generally sucks again. Against them. Very rarely do you actually ever get rewarded for finding vantage points, so bosses just end up becoming big moving targets with health bars. Vanitas, the poster child for amazing boss design, just loves to teleport out of random hits even if you do find a vantage point on him. Oh yay, a boss where I just get to sit back and reflect shots all day. Finally! Why would I even want to think when I'm playing an action RPG? Oh cool, a boss that just deflects all my openings and can instantly teleport behind me. How fun. I personally think the biggest defense of bosses in Birth by Sleep are the endgame bosses and beyond. We've already established thus far that commands are the best resource that you have, but once you hit endgame, that Geo Impact, or R Solemn, or Time Splicer that you've been working on the whole game, it's completely worthless, and it'll probably end up getting you killed. Better break out those surges, mind squares, and cures. Like, you'd think that a game that pushes this one resource the whole time would actually reward you for using, like, a wide variety of commands, but instead, only like 10% of your commands are any good. It just seems like such a slap in the face to the people who actually enjoyed BBS's command-centric battle system. Why use what's worked for 99% of the game? No, no, let's just sit back and reflect dark volley shots for maximum damage. Amazing final boss, Square Enix. You really outdone yourself this time. Super bosses in Birth by Sleep are just... <sighs> I'm not even sure if there's a word to describe how poorly designed they are. Oh man, this is really hard to avoid. I'm really using my tactical prowess and stuff. Oh yeah, this move, I'm uh, really feeling the, um, the hype. Just take a look at this architecture, man. Like, all these blocks and shit. And this move that lasts 5,000 years? Oh yeah, I'm really using my brain for this one. Do you know how much brain power it takes to press the square button? Cause, uh, it's a... It's a lot. It's like they were sitting at the Square Enix office or whatever, developing these bosses like, Hey Jim? Yeah, Bob? Remember when bosses in Cage 2 had identifiable weaknesses and you could punish them for it? Yeah? Well, I was thinking for this guy we could just make him, you know, not have those anymore and just make you eat shit for trying anything on him. Man, that is a fantastic idea. You remember when those bosses in Kingdom Hearts 2 actually got stunned for taking hits? Yeah? Well, I thought that was pretty stupid. Check this guy out. I made him not get stunned ever, and he just teleports around spamming moves, leaving you hopeless. Oh yeah, I see. Yeah, I thought that whole avoiding taking damage thing was fucking stupid. I think we should punish them on the spot and make them eat shit the whole fight. I really think this will push the meta of boss development. You know what, Jim? I think you're right. Is there really anything that I need to say about this guy that hasn't already been said? If you use combos, you'll get punished. He's really only weak to surges and only has one safe opening. And even then, if you exploit that weakness too much, you'll get punished. So if you're playing as Aqua or Vin, all you have to do is exploit that weakness and then dodge roll the rest of the fight and you'll be safe. For Terra, you have to deal with moves like Lasers, Tornado, Mega Flare, Doom, Raging Storm, and halfway through the fight, he casts Vanish, too. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Birth by Sleep's version of Yu-Gi-Oh! Forbidden Memories. I'm not even sure if I would really classify this as a boss. In an actual boss fight, you have to strategize, find weaknesses, 
time dodges, avoid taking damage, manage your resources, and it makes you feel like you're actually, like, interacting with something, and that something is challenging you. This does not feel like that. There's no real strategizing, there's only one weakness to punish, and you don't have to time any dodges unless you're Terra, and in that case, you just dodge until you get hit, and when you do get hit, you just use Cure. And then you're most likely to get hit by Doom or Tornado or whatever, so why... Why do I even care? The sad thing is Lingering Will and Mysterious Figure seem like very similar bosses. They both have a huge arsenal of moves, they move in and close distance on you really quickly, you can get combo to shreds by both of them. But with Lingering Will, you can't just spam dodge roll and win. You have to time your dodges, you have to predict what's coming and react. You have to constantly be thinking about the next move, otherwise you'll get trashed. The difference is with Mysterious Figure, you only feel like you're doing a lot, and that's because you're mashing the square button a bunch to dodge, and you're seeing your character dodge all these crazy moves, and the music makes you feel like the fight is super hype. But are you actually thinking about his next move and what to do? No, not really. All you have to do is roll, punish the move, roll, repeat. And if you don't have a roll, then yeah, it's... It's almost like I forgot Terra was a character in this game when they designed this boss. And I mean, it's not really that surprising since Terra is such a forgettable character though. Hey! <laughs> the bottom line is Lingering Will forces you to really think about what you're doing and have things planned out, but with Mysterious Figure, you don't have to really think at all. And that leads to my final point. See, even with the bullshit bosses and the wonky battle system, people still defend Birth by Sleep's gameplay and find it enjoyable, and I could never really figure out why that is. But I think I see what makes BBS so appealing to people, and this is the reason. Birth by Sleep is mindlessly easy. And don't take that the wrong way, that's not meant to be an insult to people who like Birth by Sleep's gameplay. What I mean by this is, Birth by Sleep is exactly like Cookie Clicker. If you've never heard of this game before, just Google it, it's free. Just play it for like five minutes and you'll see what I mean. It starts off slow at first, just like Birth by Sleep starts off slow, but once you buy some auto-clickers, grandmas, cookie farms, things just skyrocket and you're just making cookies like crazy. You keep clicking and the numbers get bigger to the point where you just don't want to stop, the clicky sound is nice, the achievements, the little plus you see every single time you click. All these gameplay elements are just mindless and addictive. It's the same exact reason why phone games like Candy Crush are super popular. They're just designed to be addictive, and there's a lot of science to back that up. And this has a lot to do with Birth by Sleep because it has a lot of the same addictive elements. Using Magnega and Thundaga to blow away a whole wave of enemies and seeing all the bright health and money drops just makes you feel happy. It creates positive reinforcement. The mindless melding of commands, the constant power-up feeling in a command style, all the sparkly and flashy particle effects. The game is constantly encouraging you and teaching you that the triangle button is the fun button. And I won't deny that I enjoyed plowing through Mirage Arena with a couple Mega Flares and then spamming Shotlock on the boss. These are mindless gameplay aspects that work on everyone. But here's my problem. In Kingdom Hearts 2, you were allowed to play the game in a mindlessly easy, mash X to win way, similar to Birth by Sleep. But you were also allowed to play in a complex way. In fact, I would even say that playing smart enhanced your overall playing experience because it felt more rewarding when you beat a boss with your wit and overall knowledge of the game. But with Birth by Sleep, you can't play it in a complex way. The system just doesn't allow for it. You can use a D-Link here, or a creative command here, but for the most part, you're just going to be using the same exact thing, rinse and repeat, the whole game through. And I personally think that Kingdom Hearts deserves better. So, to sum everything up, let's answer the questions from all the way in the beginning of the video. So, number one. How does Birth by Sleep compare to Kingdom Hearts 1 and Kingdom Hearts 2? Like I mentioned before, it was certainly rated as one of the best KH games ever made. However, it seems that critics viewed Birth by Sleep from a surface level perspective, instead of delving deeper to notice how bland both the characters and the combat both were. Which I find interesting because KH2 was criticized heavily for its Mash X gameplay, but Birth by Sleep? What? There is no button mashing in this game. What are you talking about? But the funny thing is, for as much as I absolutely despise this game, if I had to rate it, it would probably get like a 6 out of 10. It's not the worst game in the world by any means, there are far worse games out there nowadays. At least this one actually functions normally... somewhat. The real reason I hate this game is because it changed Kingdom Hearts as a whole. Basically, Birth by Sleep was the turning point of the franchise. At the end of Kingdom Hearts 2, Nomura saw that people loved Kingdom Hearts 2 for multiple different reasons, and decided to focus on expanding the story and 
making the flashy gameplay more accessible and easier to understand. The problem, though, is Nomura forgot, or he didn't even realize, that there was more to Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2 than just complex story and flashy gameplay. And because Birth by Sleep was the turning point, and because it didn't have those essential elements that made KH1 and KH2 great, they developed the other games the same exact way they developed Birth by Sleep, and they have the same exact flaws. And this answers the second question, how does Birth by Sleep impact the rest of the Kingdom Hearts series? Days attempted to create backstory, but instead made the series even more confusing with the introduction of Shion. And its gameplay with its panel system and mission system was really by no means stellar or impressive. Recoded's plot is just... What I really am is Jiminy's journal. Something. And while I think Recoded pulled off the command deck really well, it was bogged down by all the gimmick stages where you couldn't use normal combat. Dream Drop Distance story is just... I am Xehanort from the most distant past. Wow. And its gameplay is almost a carbon copy of Birth by Sleep. Every title released around Birth by Sleep's release shared the exact same flaws as Birth by Sleep. They were all full of unnecessary story complications and completely new and unpolished battle systems. And now we have Chi, which is a prequel to Birth by Sleep with even more new characters and more backstory? <sighs> this is the series that we're left with, ladies and gentlemen. And we're still waiting for KH3 all these years later. Only this time, the hype that followed the release of KH2 is transformed into, sadly, a lot of disappointment. Now, before I end this video, I'd like to point out a few things. If you enjoy Birth by Sleep as a game, even after watching this entire video, that is perfectly fine. You have every right to. I would never sit here and tell you that you played and experienced the game the wrong way. It just comes down to different opinions and tastes. While this video is certainly my personal take on Birth by Sleep and how much I don't like the game, I would never try and force anyone to think and feel the same exact way I do about the game. My goal was never to do that. The goal of this video, however, is to challenge you. It's to hopefully get you thinking critically about this series. To get you to ask questions and think that maybe the direction Square Enix is taking the story isn't the best, and maybe you could have done things differently. Maybe the combat system in Birth by Sleep I've loved all this time really isn't the greatest, and maybe KH2 really is more than just a button masher. Everybody has different tastes and opinions, and I acknowledge that. But if I can get you to think critically about how Square is handling this series, then I've done my job. I'm on the same team as you guys. I want Kingdom Hearts 3 to do well, but I think the way that Square has been doing things up to this point is not how we're going to get there. Do I think that Kingdom Hearts 3 will be a good game? Not sure. But hey, one can only hope.